The eight canons of the Holy and Ecumenical Third Council interpreted. Canon I. Since those who for any reason, whether of an ecclesiastical or of corporeal nature, are absent from the Holy Council and have remained in their own town or district, ought not to be left in ignorance of the Council's regulations regarding them. We make known to your holiness and love that if any metropolitan of the province has apostatized from the Holy and Ecumenical Council and joined the convocation of the apostasy, or has joined it thereafter, or has adopted the sentiments of Celestius or intends to adopt them, he shall have no power whatsoever to perpetrate anything against the bishops of the province. Being already expelled and bereft of every function and of all ecclesiastical communion by the council here. Moreover, he shall be liable in any case, to be expelled from the rank of the episcopate by the very bishops of the province and by surrounding metropolitans who adhere to the beliefs of orthodoxy. Interpretation. This canon notifies those absent from the council of the deposition from office of John of Antioch, of Theodoret the bishop of Cyrus, of Ebas the bishop of Edessa, and of the thirty bishops who stayed with them or sympathized with them, by saying, since the bishops who failed to appear at this holy council on account of any obstacle, whether ecclesiastical or corporeal law ought to be apprised of all proceedings affecting them. We notify your loving group that any metropolitan that has separated from this holy and ecumenical council and has joined the Congress of Apostasy, the one of Nestorius, that is to say, and of John and his party, or that intends to join it hereafter, or that has entertained the heretical views held by Celestius, the same shall have no power to do any ill turn to the bishops, or even to the laymen, that are orthodox that is to say, because he, S.C., any such metropolitan, has been deprived of every ecclesiastical communion and sacred function by this council, and because he is to be rendered utterly destitute hereafter and henceforth of the rank of the episcopate even by those same orthodox bishops and surrounding metropolitans, can it too? If, on the other hand, any provincial bishops have failed to attend the Holy Council and have joined the apostasy, or should attempt to do so, or even after subscribing to the deposition of Nestorius have receded to the convocation of apostasy, all such persons, in the judgment that has seemed best to the Holy Council, have alienated themselves from holy orders and have forfeited their rank. Interpretation This canon, too, like the first one, says that in case any bishops from the province of Antiochia have absented themselves from the Council, whether it be that they have united with the apostasy of the other one held in Antiochia, or that they intend to join it hereafter, or that even after signing and confirming the document deposing Nestorius from office they have turned back to his apostatic group. As for these persons, I say, it has appeared reasonable to the Holy Council for them to be strangers to holy orders and outcasts from the rank of the Episcopate. Canon 3. If some of the clergymen in any city or district have been shorn of holy orders by Nestorius and his party on account of their believing rightly, we have adjudged it right and just that they be restored to their own rank. We collectively bid the clergymen who agree in their beliefs with the Orthodox and Ecumenical Council not to submit in any way whatever to the bishops who have apostatized or have deserted us. Interpretation. Because of the fact that when Nestorius was Patriarch of Constantinople he excommunicated and deposed those clergymen who did not agree with him, and, moreover, even the bishops in other countries who held his views did the same. Therefore the present canon judged it right for those who had been thus deposed to receive back their own rank. Accordingly, speaking generally, it ordered that those clergymen who were of the same mind as this Orthodox and Ecumenical Council should take care not to submit in any way whatever to the apostate bishops. Canon 4. If any of the clergymen should apostatize and dare, either publicly or privately, to hold the beliefs of Nestorius or of Celestius, the Holy Council has deemed it just and right that these men too should be deposed from office. Interpretation. This canon too, like the preceding one, deals with those clergymen who should apostatize, and, either in public or in private, should dare to believe or teach the dogma, or doctrine, of Nestorius and of Celestius, who shared his sentiments. By saying that it has been deemed but just by the Holy Council for any such persons to be deposed from their rank. Canon V. As for all those who have been condemned by the Holy Council, or by their own bishops, for improper acts, and to whom Nestorius and those sharing his views and beliefs have sought, or should seek, to give back communion or rank. Uncanonically and in accordance with the indifference shown by Nestorius in all matters, we have deemed it right and just that they too remain without benefit and that they be left nevertheless opposed from office. Interpretation. The present canon specifies that as regards all those clergymen who on account of any sins calling for excommunication or deposition from office were excommunicated or deposed from office by this holy council or by their own bishops, and whom Nestorius and his sympathizers either dared to give a pardon absolving them from excommunication or restoring them to the operation of holy orders, or shall dare to do so hereafter, without discriminating between what is allowable and what is not allowable, we have judged it but right, I say that all such persons shall remain without the benefit of any such uncanonical pardon and be left again deposed from office precisely as before. Canon V. 
likewise in regard to any persons who should wish to alter in any way whatsoever anything that has been enacted in the Holy Council in Ephesus concerning anyone, the Holy Council has prescribed that if they be bishops or clergymen, they are to lose their own rank entirely, while if they be laymen, they are to be excluded from communion. Interpretation The preceding canons are more particular. While this one simply decrees in a general way that all those persons who dare to alter in any way whatever has been enacted as concerning any question in a council held in Ephesus, are to be deposed from office if they are bishops or clergymen, or excommunicated if they are laymen. Canon 7. These things having been read aloud, the Holy Council then decreed that no one should be permitted to offer any different belief or faith, or in any case to write or compose any other, than the one defined by the Holy Fathers who convened in the city of Nicaea, with Holy Spirit. As for those who dare either to compose a different belief or faith, or to present one, or to offer one to those who wish to return to recognition of the truth, whether they be Greeks or Jews, or they be members of any heresy whatever, they, if bishops or clergymen, shall be deprived as bishops of their episcopate, and as clergymen of their clericate, but if they are laymen, they shall be anathematized. In an equally applicable way, if any persons be detected or caught, whether bishops or clergymen or laymen, in the act of believing or teaching the things embodied in the exposition, or dissertation, presented by Carisius the Presbyter concerning the inhomination, i.e., incarnation, of the only begotten Son of God, or, by any chance, the unholy and perverse dogmas of Nestorius, which have even been subjoined, let them stand liable to the judgment of this holy and ecumenical council. As a consequence, that is to say, the bishop shall be deprived of his episcopate, and be left deposed from office, while the clergyman shall likewise forfeit his clericate. If, on the other hand, any such person be a layman, let him too be anathematized, as aforesaid. Interpretation In view of the fact that at this holy and ecumenical council's meeting there were read both the creed of the holy and ecumenical first council held in Nicaea, and the creed of Jewish minded Nestorius, in which his unholy dogmas were set forth and which Carisius the presbyter of Philadelphia brought to the council, after they had been read, this holy council issued this canon decreeing that it is not permissible for anyone to compose and write, or to offer to those converted from any other faith to orthodoxy another creed than the symbol of the faith defined and decreed by the Holy Fathers who assembled in the city of Nicaea and were enlightened by the Holy Spirit. As for those persons who shall dare to compose any other symbol of faith, or creed, or to present it openly, and to offer it to any of the Greeks and Jews and heretics turning away from faith to recognition and knowledge of the truth, such persons, if they be bishops and clergymen, are to be expelled from their episcopate and clericate, respectively, but if laymen they shall be anathematized. Similarly, too, all those who are discovered to be thinking to themselves or to be teaching others the unholy and heretical dogmas of Nestorius concerning the incarnation of the only begotten Son of God, contained in the exposition of faith composed by him, but brought to this council by the presbyter named Carisius, these persons also, I say, if they be bishops and clergymen, are to stand deposed, and expelled from their episcopate and clericate, respectively, but if they be laymen, they are to be anathematized, as we said before. Canon 8. Our fellow Bishop Reginus, most beloved by God, and with him the most God-beloved bishops of the province of the Cypriots Zeno and of Agrius, has announced an innovation, a thing which is contrary to the ecclesiastical laws and the canons of the holy apostles, and one which touches the freedom of all. Hence, since common ailments require more drastic treatment, on the ground that they do greater damage, and especially in view of the fact that the Bishop of Antioch, far from following the ancient custom, has been performing the ordinations in Cyprus, according to information given in Libeli and by oral statements made by most pious gentlemen who have approached the Holy Council. Therefore those who preside over the churches in Cyprus shall retain their privilege unaffected and inviolate, according to the canons of the Holy Fathers and ancient custom, whereby they shall themselves perform the ordinations of the most reverent bishops. The same rule shall hold good also with regard to the other dioceses and churches everywhere, so that none of the bishops most beloved by God shall take hold of any other province that was not formerly and from the beginning in his jurisdiction, or was not, that is to say, held by his predecessors. But if anyone has taken possession of any and has forcibly subjected it to his authority, he shall receive it back to its rightful possessor, in order that the canons of the fathers be not transgressed, nor the secular fastest be introduced under the pretext of divine services, lest imperceptibly and little by little we lose the freedom which our Lord Jesus Christ, the liberator of all men, has given us as a free gift by his own blood. It has therefore seemed best to the holy and ecumenical council that the rights of every province, formerly and from the beginning belonging to it, be preserved clear and inviolable, in accordance with the custom which prevailed of yore, each metropolitan having permission to take copies of the proceedings for his own security. If, on the other hand, anyone introduce any form conflicting with the decrees which have now been sanctioned, it has seemed best to the entire holy and ecumenical council that it be invalid and of no effect. Interpretation 
inasmuch as Cyprus, so far as concerned secular administration, was subject to the Duke of Antioch, and was wont to send it an army commander, or general, it came to pass that the Bishop of Antioch, in imitation of this secular and civil form and law, undertook to show authority over the same Cyprus, with regard to both the religious and the ecclesiastical administration, by ordaining the bishops in Cyprus extraterritorially and not as a matter of ancient custom. This, however, was a thing that was contrary to Ap. C.C. 34 and 35. After receiving Archbishop Reginus of Constantia, which used to be called Salamis but is now known as Amicasios, and the bishops accompanying, namely, Zeno of Cyrene, and of Agrius of Solon, who in writing as well as Viva Voce reported these facts. The council decrees by the present canon that, in accordance with the canons and in accordance with ancient custom, the metropolitans of Cyprus are themselves to ordain the bishops in Cyprus, and to be left unmolested and unconstrained by anyone else. But, making the canon general and Catholic, the fathers of this council add that this same rule shall hold also in regard to diocese, or administrations, and provinces everywhere else, to the end that no bishop be permitted to usurp and appropriate any other province that has not formerly and from the beginning been subject either to his authority or to that of his predecessors if, nevertheless, anyone should appropriate it forcibly, he must return it, in order that the canons of the fathers be not transgressed, and in order that prelates, under the pretext of sacerdotalism, may not cloak a secret ambition and vainglorious yearning for secular or worldly authority, and hence becoming slaves to injustice lose little by little the freedom which the liberator of all men Jesus Christ has graciously given us with his own blood. It has appeared reasonable to this holy ecumenical council that the righteous and just privileges be kept clear and inviolable which formerly and from the beginning as a matter of ancient custom each province has been entitled to. Accordingly, each metropolitan shall have permission to receive a transcript of the present canon for security and confirmation of the privileges of his metropolis. If, on the other hand, anyone should come out with a form, I e. a civil law or a royal decree, contrary to the present canon, it has appeared reasonable to all this holy council for that civil law to remain invalid and ineffective. Read also the interpretations of Ap. C.C. 34 and 35. Letter of the same holy and ecumenical third council addressed to the sacred synod in Pamphylia in favor of Eustathius who had become their metropolitan. Seeing that the God-inspired Bible says, Do everything heedfully, Proverbs 25 19 Syriac. Those who have had the fortune to be admitted to holy orders ought indeed to give a special consideration to what is to be done in every case with all exactitude. For thus will they live through life with their affairs hopefully arranged and will be carried onward as though by a favorable wind to the goal which is the most desirable, and it seems that this argument is reasonable enough. Yet in the course of time a bitter and unendurable sorrow overwhelmed the mind and terribly muddled it, and failing to reap its expectations, it found little of benefit to comfort it in regard to the unjust circumstances of its plight. We have seen some such misfortune overtake most relevant and most godly Eustathius. For though he was indeed ordained canonically, as has been attested, yet, having been embarrassed, as he says, by some persons, and having met with unseemly circumstances, and owing to his being too much accustomed to idleness he got tired of the cares heaped upon him, and being unable to put up with the fear of incurring defamation as a result of developments, we know not how, he turned an account. For, once having accepted the responsibility of sacerdotal cares, he ought to have kept on with spiritual staunchness and to have made every effort to discharge his duties even at the expense of much pain and perspiration voluntarily as one receiving remuneration. But since, once having failed to cope with the situation, he proved incapable, though rather as a result of idleness than of laziness and indolence. Your godliness necessarily ordained our most reverent and most godly brother and fellow bishop Theodore to take care of the church. For the position could not be left open and remain without anyone to look after the flocks of the Savior. But inasmuch as he came back weeping, not about losing the city or by way of quarreling over the fact that the church was turned over to the said most godly Bishop Theodore. But begging for the honor and title of bishop he had been enjoying up till then, we all felt sorry for him because of his being an old man, and deeming his tears a common ground of sympathy. We hastened to learn whether the man had suffered any illegal deposition or had been charged by other persons with improprieties while muttering things to the detriment of his reputation, and, indeed, we learned that nothing of the sort had occurred but that instead of any indictment being brought against him the man himself has submitted his resignation. Hence we could not blame your godliness for dutifully replacing him by the said most reverend Bishop Theodore. But since there is no strong reason to quarrel with his incapacity, we ought rather to have mercy on the old man, who had been away from his city and far from home for a long time. We have deemed just and have decreed without any argument that he should retain both the name of Bishop and the honor and communion of the Episcopate but in such manner as not to permit him to perform ordinations nor to officiate in divine services in church on his own account, unless by any chance taken along or allowed to do so by a brother and fellow bishop, in pursuance of affection and love in Christ. But if you care to give him a better position of any kind, either now or hereafter, this will please the Holy Council. 
Interpretation. This Eustathius, of whom the present letter speaks, was Bishop of Pamphylia, a province in Italia. But after becoming engrossed in the cares and matters of the episcopate, and getting tired on account of his faint-heartedness and inexperience in regard to the affairs and temptations of the episcopate, he tendered a written resignation. Hence the synod there ordained another bishop in place of him. However, he afterwards came to this holy ecumenical council with tears in his eyes and begging, not for the episcopate which he had resigned, but to have the honor and name of a bishop. Feeling sorry for him and sympathizing with him on account of his advanced age and tears and the fact that he was far from home and hearth. And particularly because of the fact that his resignation had not been submitted after a threat of deposition for viciousness, not on account of his carelessness and indolence, for if such had been the case. Of course the council would not have been warranted in showing him mercy, nor would it have bestowed upon him the mere name of bishop, but because of his faint-heartedness and incapacity for affairs. The council decreed that he should have a title of bishop, or, in other words, the right to call himself a bishop, and the honor, or, in other words, the right to sit down with bishops, and the communion, or, in other words, the right to partake of communion along with them, and to officiate with them, and to assist in ordinations the other bishops, though not to perform any himself of his own accord, but only with the permission of the local bishop. In addition the council says to the bishops of Pamphylia, that in case they should think of something better and higher to give to Eustathius, either now or hereafter, this will please the council too. This means nothing else, according to the exegete anonymous, than the possibility of their appointing him bishop in some vacant province, 